Yeah, so I can start with um, just a little link between you and us in Copenhagen. Monica Paltek and Ole actually went to the Carlsberg Laboratories in Copenhagen, where Morten Meldahl, who is the other Nobel Prize laureate, together with a fantastic name, right, Sharpless. Imagine to have two Nobel Prizes and your last name is Sharpless. I don't know how that, 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 that works. So, the story here is a too long title, but the point is I'll talk about a little bit about decoding glycans for what the work we do in Copenhagen, and then I'll end with a little translational tale from a small biotech company in uh, Boston that I'm uh, involved in. So, I guess I don't have to tell this crowd that carbohydrates is much more than an energy source. Uh, it is clearly also involved in this, and we know it, right? We have heard about it over and over again, but this is interesting. This, uh, this is the Spanish flu. Here we apparently collected all people in one room, and this is from more or less today with COVID, where we try to get people to stay inside and stay away from each other. This is all due to this, right? That you have a spread of a virus, so you feel like stepping a little to the side here because there are so small green virus particles sitting in that uh, spread that will insert into the respiratory tract, adhere uh, to the surface epithelium through glycans, and we know that, we just heard about it. And it's not unimportant where it is, right? So you have different glycans, different places. You have the classical 2326 distribution in the upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, and that has a role for whether it's a seasonal flu or the avian flu. And we also know that we can play a little with the um, different modulations of the glycans. We have the nerimidase, where after the virus particle binds to a silic acid, it needs to release itself, so it needs to cleave off the anchor by the nerimidase, and we can block it with Tamiflu, but it doesn't necessarily always work, because then we get an infection, a lung infection, with these cotton changes in the, in the lungs, and that is not due to the virus, right? This is due to inflammation, so are glycans involved? Yeah, of course they're involved. Because that's the neutrophil leukocytation, extravasation of the leukocytes in the respiratory tract that induce the inflammation. And again, we find glycans at the centerpiece. And this is, of course, also the case with uh, COVID in different aspects. And I'll not go into that. Just as a sort of a general introduction to the whole field. And we all know that these glycans are built by hundreds of glycyl transferases putting sugars on top of each other in the secretory tract. And eventually, we will create this plethora of glycans that I just mentioned, with the glycosphingolipids, the ending glycans, the proteoglycans, and different types of oling glycans, where my key interest is the mutant type O glycylation. So, we can take a, a sort of a global perspective on this, and I'll be very specific in a moment. But if we look at it, I just talked about the infections. We also have the biologics. This is a big production tank of recombinant production of therapeutics. It could be a protein, and we know how important it is to secure the right type of silylation. If you do not have that, we take away our recombinant protein after injection by receptors in the liver. There are the immune system, clear the, the leukocyte, but also getting more and more clear that it's important for immune tolerance. And then there's the gastrointestinal tract and the lungs with the mucin. and there's basically nothing but glycans. It's a dense layer of oak glycans that protects our inner surfaces, quality control within the cells, and then the blood type antigens. And by the way, I can mention that if I go to my, so I'm a physician by training, and if I go to my physician friend and ask them, okay, please tell me what is the background beh behind the blood type antigens, they don't know. So I think there's some teaching to do. But despite that we have these defined functions that I just mentioned, that we do know a few items and there's a few specific cases where glycans play a role. There's a lot of things we do not know, especially because we have glycans everywhere and we have a hard time defining their molecular functions. And part of the reason I think is because of this. In a normal world, you have a disease or phenotype because you have a problem with the function of a specific protein in a specific gene. In our world, we have a gene that doesn't function, that's an enzyme. And an enzyme will modify multiple different substrates. It is one of these, or the combination of these, that will give a certain disease or induce a certain function. So it's pretty difficult to backtrack from these phenotypes back to a specific enzyme and then a functional aspect. 
So what do we do at Copenhagen uh, Center for Glycomics? I've mentioned it in quite a few of my talks. We map and dissect. We try to map where the, pro the glycans are localized in the protein. We sort of correlate the glycan sites with functional domains in the proteins. So are they close to certain specific domains? And then we take a genetic entry point, not only to buy genome-wide association studies, but we also try to analyze, by knocking out individual glycol transferases, what happens to the cells or the tissues we create with those cells. And I'll talk about that. So my key interest is really mucin type O glycolation, and it's because initially when we started out more than 20, 20 years ago, actually 10 years ago with this project, we had very limited understanding of where the O glycans are positioned in the proteome. So O glycans, they actually come in different flavors, right? So we have the O glucnac, which is the intracellular glycolation. We have the O man on dystroglycan and cadherins. We have O fucose and O glucose on Notch. We have O-galactose on collagens. We have o glucnac now also on the external side by an individual enzyme that controls that, particular on, on Notch. And then we silos that kickstarts the whole proto-glycan pathway. And then we have our favorite, the mucin type o glycolation, where we put a galnag residue, one of our youth, your few friends here, a galnag residue on a serine or threonine, governed by 20 galnag T. So a multitude of different enzymes that governs this, um, this addition. And many of these enzymes are linked to diseases. It could be B cell immunity, dyslipidemia. It could be phosphate metabolism that we'll talk about in a minute. It could be response to different therapies and colon cancer susceptibility, et cetera. So many different links to human disease. And still we have a limited understanding what they actually do and where they are localized at least 10 years ago. So we thought, okay, let's start by just mapping where do we have these glycans. The problem is you cannot just take a protein, chop it down, subject it to mass spectrometry, and then analyze where the glycans are because they are heterogeneous. You have microheterogeneity because of these elongation steps that takes place in that individual galnac. So what to do? Well, we simply just eliminated it. By eliminating the glycan step that adds a galactose on top of this galnac by knocking out cosmic or CO1 enzyme that does the trick, you could simplify the cells. That means you get simple cells as we call it. These simple cells you can grow now in bigger cultures. You can make a lysate out of that. And because you only have one sugar on your protein, when you do a triptych digest, you suddenly have peptides you can purify by lectin chromatography step, elute, and do mass spec. And now you can figure out where these glycans are localized. And when we did that, and I would say now in combination with all the other endeavors out there that are the operator system, that are clearly the click chemistry, that has also helped with that. But if we collect everything together, we get around 15,000 sites in the human proteome. So basically 80% of all the proteins floating through the secretory pathway will be modified with a single galnac. So when we took all those sites and did a statistical analysis and correlated with functional domains within the protein, what we found was that they're very close to cleavage sites, sort of furin proteases and atom proteases, propeptides and biactive peptides, and then a few in specific domains, such as LDLR class A repeats, thyroidoxin, EF hand, EG like, and sushi domains. And we could take a step further and say, okay, now we have a mapping exercise, and then we had the genetic entry point. You can combine the two saying, okay, if you have a phenotype out there, does that match with what we find? And can we use that as an entry point? So there has been a historic link between O glycans and cleavage protection. That a have a glycan is difficult for an enzyme to cleave at that position that could regulate cleavage. Especially it became apparent that, that was also linked to site-specific glycylation with this disease, familial tumor calcinosis, that is linked to a problem with the hormone FGF23 that controls phosphate and calcium metabolism and causes these depositions of calcified areas in your uh, soft tissue and in your bones. And it turned out that a galnac T3, one of the enzymes that adds a galnac to a serine or therine, if that is not working, it's not adding a galnac to FGF23, and hence it can be cleaved by furin and rendered inactive. So making that link between a specific event and the disease. And if you took that, yes, by the way, this is also a good example. So hereditary angioedema, 
where you have an order of activation of factor 12. Factor 12 is not only important in your calculations cascade, it's also controlling your calcarine pathway. So that is part of the inflammation cascade. And if you do not have a galnag in that factor 12, you get an increased auto activation. So again, a site-specific oglycyl event that accelerates your activation of your calcarine pathway, you get a massive inflammation and you get these features. So if you take those situation and then take, okay, there's something about cleavage and glycans and search the whole proteome, you find, and that is something that is spearheaded by Katrina Scholler from, from our lab, she found that there's a clearly a protection of MMPs and ectodomain shedding by specific glycans, but also now in small peptide hormones such as calcitonin, glucagon, and et cetera. So a very interesting field where you can control cleavage by specific glycylation events, um, especially by olein glycylation. Okay, so what about if we just, our mapping exercise without knowing anything before, we do not have a necessarily a link to cleavage. What do we find? That this is another good example. Then, then we find these sugars sitting in the so-called LDLR class A domains in the LDL receptor. The LDL receptor, we all know, is important for uptake of lipids from the circulation. And it turns out that these sugars are important for that process. And they're not only on the LDLR receptor, they are also localized in multiple different LRPs. And it turned out that Galnac T11, one of the enzymes, is essential for adding these sugars. And that L and Galnac T11 is linked to chronic kidney decline through a glycylation of an LRP2 called megalin in the proximal tubule. So yet another example, you come from an event, you look at the whole mapping, and you localize it to a specific protein and then link it to a specific enzyme. So if we sort of take it all together, and I didn't mention the importance of old galnag sugars for immune recognition by Cyclex and MGL and galactins, there's a shielding of cleavage, there's the glycans as an effective barrier against pathogens and viral and bacterial interactions, the LDLR example, and then of course our old favorite PSGL1 interaction, important for leukocyte rolling, where we know that it is a core 2 glycan right next to a sulfated residue that is essential for this interaction. And there are many more examples. This is just highlighting different themes. So what about our genetic entry point? What can we do there to find new functions? So here the whole concept is that if you have a cell, it is super heterogeneous in the types of glycans. And it's difficult to make all these glycans one by one. Instead, the glycogenome is simple. It's about 200 genes. You can knock them out one by one. Then you get cells that are amenable to proteomics and they are dissectable, and you can begin to move forward from there. So we take this approach, like pruning a tree or a plant. You can knock out the initiation step. You can look at the elongation branching, and you can look at the capping step of the different glycan structures. We can look at it slightly different. And here it is initiation by the individual enzyme that controls that. These are all the gene names. We have core extension, elongation branching, and capping. So here's the glycosphingal lipids, ending glycans, olein glycans, proteoglycans, et cetera. So you can take each of the different branches and types of glycylation step by step, and that will allow you to create individual cells with defined glycan structures. Now, by knocking out individual enzymes in combination using CRISPR-Cas, we started out with sink fingers, but now CRISPR-Cas is obviously a sort of a, a fantastic help. It's easy and it's applicable we can make cells that will only express all glycans, or only express end glycans, or only a certain type of silation, et cetera, et cetera. These cells we can take, and then we can grow them in culture, and then we get a cell-based glycan array that you can probe into action. So you can take your cells, subject them with flow cytometry or whatever you want, and then monitor the interaction with selectins. It could be galactins and cyclex, and this is what we have done. So in, in this case, with uh, our p-selectin case, it will only react if you had an oak like hand there with the right sulfation pattern. And uh, that you could use to sort of probe the native interaction. So how will these protein interact in the context of the cellular membrane? Because I think the point is that with glycans, it's about context and location. Then we can use the cells with a little help from Harrison Ford <laughs> to produce recombinant proteins with defined glycans. 
And that is helpful. Um, so basically, there's been a collection of glycogen-engineered cell lines, well-defined, homogeneous, and novel glycosylation capacities. You could, for instance, make a protein with mannose-6-phosphate in the right combination of silylation, so you will um, maintain circulation, but still have the ability to have uptake through the mannose-6-phosphate receptor. There's also an example where we could use this for, for allergy vaccines, something we published a few years ago. It's just a little sidestep to make it translational. That if you look at this, there's about 20% of the population that are affected by type 1 allergy, hay fever or asthma. Vaccination is actually a promising approach to uh, avoid and remove some of the symptoms. But the current vaccines are all dependent on allergens with inherent problems, so natural allergens that you harvest with inherent problems of variability. So, what if you took this birch allergen, bet we won? That is not glycosylated. It's an unglycosylated protein. And you can combine it with a little tag that will secure in glycosylation or O glycosylation and produce it through the genetically engineered cells. So if you take a Cho cell where you knocked out MGAT1, it will only produce high mannose. Or a Cho cell where you knocked out Cor1 or Cospec, it will only produce Galnac. Then you have an allergen that is now prone to be taken up by antigen presenting cells and rec re recognized by DC sign or MGL. And we have done that, and I'll skip all the in vitro stuff, but just simply say that if we do that in an animal study in vivo, we inject it and we see whether it's taken up and it's going to the relevant lymph nodes, we see that the allergen with the galnac residues and the mannose are increasingly taken up by the draining lymph node. And we can also use it in a sort of in vivo setting where we immunize mice with these allergens, with and without the sugars, and then we sensitize them with an allergen, a natural allergen, and we look for, okay, do we get any change in their immune reactivity to the, to the allergens then either by antibodies or by T cell proliferation? And what we find is that we get a, a severe inhibition of the immune response once we have the glycans on. So that glycosylated allergens more effectively target draining lymph nodes and induce tolerance in this setting. And this is in a prophylactic setting. So I grant you that. Okay, back to this question on whether we can use our genetic entry point to look for functions and phenotypes. In other words, can we do a phenotype in a dish? I think the, the message here is you can look at simple cells that we now genetically modified, but they are not really good to look for phenotypes. It's a poor reflection of reality. There's no differentiation, no homostasis, barrier, et cetera, is lacking in a single cell that you culture. You can also look at an animal model. I think that is great, and we cannot live without if we want to understand what's really going on. But it's complex, it's difficult, it takes time. And then there's sort of the uh, cheap in between, the organ uh, kind of typic 3D models or organoids. There you can actually look for differentiation, proliferation, cell cell interactions. And that is what we have done. So we have taken skin cells. We use skin as a model, as our primary model, because it's really well established. We can take our cells, grow it on collagen with embedded fibroblasts, make these cells differentiate throughout this culture system. And this is a skin that we have grown in the lab. And this is real skin. And it looks really close to the real deal. And you grow it in larger cultures. It's the same mechanism you use for, uh, for, for burn wounds, so you can really grow uh, a big piece of this. Can you look at phenotypes? Yeah. If we look at all the different knockouts we have made, I think we have over 100 now, you can definitely look at phenotypes and they're very consistent. And just to, um, just to mention that then we can use these models, could be for phenotypes, because we have it as individual cells as well. We could do molecular mechanism, do polyomics, whether it's RNA-seq or MSMS. We can look at host pathogen interactions, and we can use this as a disease model. So just to introduce the whole system, here we have our human skin. This is the wild type situation. When you have a human skin, the basal cells will not differentiate much. This is where the proliferation takes place. And the minute they go to the next level, they will begin to differentiate. So here you will have differentiation markers. They're only turned on over the basal layer that are all blue because of the derby of the nuclei. But then this differentiation path is dependent on notch. And if you knock out notch, you will delay differentiation. So if you do not have notch, you will delay differentiation. That's exactly what happened here. We knocked out notch, and we get a clear delay in differentiation. There are multiple cell layers that do not express the differentiation markers. 
Now, Nige interacts with Jagged, and Jagged is the, the ligand for Nige, and if you knock out Jagged, do you get a phenotype? Yes, you do. You lack the differentiation initially, and also the spinous layer in the middle of the skin. Now, Jagged and Nige interacts, and this interaction is dependent on a fucose. So what happens if we knock out the enzyme that puts this fucose on Nodge and Jacket? We get more or less the same phenotype as in Jacket. In other words, we can begin to get phenotypic readouts of our model that match sort of the pathway that are involved. And we can use that as an inspiration for where to look and how to begin to identify novel functions of glycans. So we have done it, and I won't go through all of it um, in the skin. We have looked at uh, knocked out glycosphingal lipids. There are barrier defects and quite a uh, few interesting other things. We have looked at in glycosylation, O glycosylation, and also the different types of notch glycosylation, and we get specific defined phenotypes in each case. So they are clearly distinct and different functions of glycans at different stages of differentiation. We can also use the model to demonstrate oncogenic features. And then Eva Bactinoidal just features, she's starting her own lab and focusing on glycobiology and using the model for that. So if I just give you an example of what happens if we look at in glycosylation in this. So here we do not want to eliminate all in glycosylation. We still want to have the high structures there because we want to maintain the folding of the proteins. What we are interested in is the termini of the N-glycans, the functional part. So what happens if we knock out MGAD1 in this model? So we maintain folding, but we eliminate the finer details at the end. And we get this, sort of a Swiss cheese phenotype. There's a large amount of intracellular vesicles in the skin. And interestingly enough, if we treat the model with a sal transferase, actually not a sal transferase, a CMP salic acid inhibitor that I got from Thomas Bolcher in the Netherlands, we get the similar phenotype. So it phenic copies uh, the MGAD1 knockout phenotype, suggesting that it's silation of ending glycans that does the trick. Now you can begin to sort of dissect and narrow down what kind of sugars are involved. But what about the function? Could we do the trick that I mentioned before, where we combine it with mass spec and uh, differ differentially affected targets? And here I'll do a little sidestep because we actually struggle quite a bit with it. How do you actually do it and can you do it re reliably? So what we did was we took, let's not pretend we are glycobiologists for a minute. I looked at the TGF beta signaling pathway because there we know what the net result should be. So we looked at TGF beta signaling pathway and said, okay, here we know the, the pathway. It is going through SMAT4, SMAT2, and SMAT3. It induces a signal that's a canonical TGF beta signaling pathway, but it can also do something else that is called the non canonical TGF beta signaling pathway, and it's evolved in almost everything you can imagine. What happens if we knock out all those factors, inc including the ligands, and then look at our phenotypes, and then combine that with mass spectrometry, both proteomics and phosphoproteomics, for the signaling pathways that are involved? What will we see? And when we did that, we saw striking phenotypes again. The canonical signaling pathway would delay differentiation in the human skin, whereas once we knocked out the receptor, we get invasive behavior of the cells, which is fitting with what we know from the clinic, that if you have a problem with TGF beta signaling pathway and it doesn't work, you will get a sort of permissive effect on cancer development. And we can scan through the, the tissue section and we can begin to see whether it's just islands or it's true invasion of the, of the cells. But the point is, we can subject these cells to proteomics and phosphoproteomics. We get a signaling pathway, and we could nail down that is what is really distinct for the TDF beta signaling pathway, the non canonical, is an activation of MAP kinases. So just quiz me in the MAP kinases now. <laughs> so we could look at the MAP kinases, and what we found was P38 was a key effect. And when we block P38 with an inhibitor, this invasive behavior in the TGF beta receptor 2 knockout could be eliminated. So you could go from a phenotype at a section and to a signaling pathway and to an inhibitor. Now, what can we do here then on the MGAD1 case? And I would say immediately this is preliminary data, it's not published, and uh, um, this is where we are at this stage. So we took the cells, we did our proteomic and a phosphoproteomic um, workflow, and we found only a very few proteins changed. 
surprisingly few, if you think about it, you eliminate complex N-linked glycans. But what we did find was a distinct change in the secretory pathway in the so-called endolysosomal system. Now it is so that in skin, you have a system called lamellar body formation. So the secretory pathway has a specialized secretion system for lipids. It packages the lipids in these bodies, lamellar bodies, and secrete them out because it's part of the waxy layer that is uh, protecting your human skin. It's also happening in other cell types, and I'll come back to that. So all our indication was that there was a problem with lamellar body formation. I'll not go through the details. And what happens if we block the lipid biosynthesis in these cells? we completely normalize the phenotype. So it really suggests, it is true, it's about lipid secretion and this pathway. Now, what is the mechanism? And the long story short is that if we look at how these uh, lamellar bodies are, are made, they are from a fusion process between autophagosome and a lysosomal compartment. And this fusion is uh, in partly dependent on the VATPase. And the mechanism involved is not clearly known. Interestingly enough, the VAT pace was recently um, structurally uh, resolved, and people found that N glycans and glycolipids actually interact to modulate its function. So we couldn't help but try to use a VAT pace inhibitor baflumycin on this system and see what happened. And what we found was we didn't get a complete normalization of the phenotype. We get a near complete normalization of the phenotype. So we believe that the VAT pace is involved, but we do not know whether it's only by pH regulation or also through a fusion process um, between the autophagosome and the lysosome. I think it's interesting if you go back in the literature then and look for something that hasn't been noticed before. You, there's an old paper by Jamie Marth and Fukuda and co-workers where they took and knocked out manosidases in combination. So in that case, you would get the same high mannose structures. And what they found was not pups that would survive, but they could look at the phenotype, and they had these small curly structures inside their pneumocytes, so their lung cells. And these pneumocytes have a lipid secretion mechanism that is similar to what is in skin, called lamellar body secretion, because they produce surfactant that is important to keep the alveoli open. So, these are EM pictures of our skin. This is EM pictures of their mice, very similar phenotypes. So we believe actually that there's a chance at least that complex ending glycans are involved in lamellar body formation as just mentioned. And that could also be important for alveoli and surfactant production uh, in that situation. And interestingly enough, there were also links to fatty liver disease and the lipid secretion that you find in this system by those mechanisms. So future will tell uh, where we will go with this. So just a few words about Oling glycans, my favorites. Uh, it will be short. We also knocked out, if we look at our old glycation pathway from before, we knocked out the elongation. We knocked out Col1 or Cosmac. We looked at the phenotypes. And there was actually not much of a change. The gross morphology was maintained in the skin. We did see delayed differentiation, a few layers of, of K10 negative cells, and the cells could not stick together if you grew them in culture. They would fall apart. And if we did treat them with protein kinase C from a previous study where we have shown that that was involved, they would come together again. So there's clearly something going on, but the gross morphology was maintained. And perhaps it's not that surprising because if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, you would have all these organisms, but they will, not all of them have elongation. But what they will all have is the initiation by the galnectes. So what would happen if we took out all the galnectes that are expressed in the human skin that we just work with, the skin cell, and these are all the enzymes that are expressed, and if we knock them out one by one in quadruplicates and individual clones, we get phenotypes in the skin that are much, much stronger than just eliminating elongation. In other words, initiation of an O-glycan pathway is much more powerful than elongation in this isolated system. I'm not talking about interaction with the immune system and other things, just the endogenous effect of the glycans in a tissue formation um, situation. So then you have a way, right? Now I have a phenotype, but how do we go to the function, and especially in this O-glycan field? So can I do the trick? No, because multiple substrates are modified. 
So how do I identify a glycylation site that drives the specific functions of phenotypes? So here we did differential glycoproteomics. We took our knockout cells, compared them with wild type, did our uh, chromatography step, and did mass spec. And we found, long story short, uh, around 3,000 sites, around 1,600 sites that were single sites that were either down or upregulated, and then about 20% of these that are regulated by individual galenic T's. So when we knock out individual galenic T's, you would see only change in those 20%. And instead of going through all these, I'll just take uh, one example with galenic T2, where we know that galenic T2 is expressed primarily in the basal cells and is important for cell matrix interaction. So if you knock out galenic T2, you would have a problem with adhesion to the cell matrix. Now in the cell matrix, there's so many different proteins. So which one should we go for? So we actually identified collagen 12, sorry, 17, as a very promising target with a site right next to a cleavage site. So, so that was a possibility, but I will not go further into this. Just mention and use this as, a, as an example for you have multiple different adhesion proteins. We have the laminins, integrins, cadherins, collagens, and then a bunch of others. And many of these we find oglycosylated. And we don't know which one necessarily to go for. So would there be a way, now that we have multiple targets that could do the trick, to get a little closer on which of these proteins we should go for and which of these sites we should go for? And our first step into this, and I'm, we are far from done, uh, that I will just share with you, is to look at oglycan site occupancy, which has been a missing element in the field. Because I tell you that there are 15,000 sites, but I don't know whether it's 1% that is occupied 100% of that site that is occupied. Because what we do is we do a lectin affinity chromatography step where we enrich for those that are modified. So we don't know whether we just enrich for the few or whether it's all of the sites that are modified. So what we did here was to look at oglycation site occupancy assessed by MS1 based relative quantification of glycopeptides and then non glycosylated equivalents. So we look at, we started with cosmic knockout, so that would release all the complexity. We only had two structures to look for, non glycosylated and the structure with one galnet. If we then took that as an entry point and input into uh, the wild type situation where we had all the different variants that we could look for and we knew how to search for it, then we could see non glycosylated and then the different variants and we could summarize that. And what we found was that about 70 regions in the cosmic we could identify as single sites where we found both counterparts. And then with that in the wild type, about 23, 24 regions that we could assess. And interestingly enough, we found a nice correlation of the occupancy between the wild type and the cosmic. People would claim that if you have elongation, then you would have a different occupancy than if you had truncation. But we didn't see that for these single sites which actually surprised me. I thought that that would um, change. But what we did find was that around 60% of the single sites had high occupancy, over 70% occupied. But 10% were sort of in the medium range and 30% or more were in the low occupancy range, under 10% carrying a galnac sugar. Now that doesn't necessarily say something about function, but it gives you an indication. So we can begin to draw these maps. Beforehand, we only had it with sites, and you could look it up, it's on, online. But now we can begin to draw the maps where we have a bright yellow, that means high occupancy, and almost white, that means very little there. I can tell you that in Jagged 1, if I can find it here, we chased this site for a very, very long time because it was uh, linked to differentiation, and it was a T3 site. And we do not find it occupied. It's like very, very low. So either it's one or two cells doing the trick, oh, it's really not relevant. So that is where we are with this. So question is, do we have 50,000 sites? I don't know. We will find out. Okay, here at the end, just a quick story about the translational aspect uh, of these definition of oak like hand sites. Um, I think the holy grail in selective and effective killing of cancer cells is really how can you hit the right cell with a very, very strong payload? It could be and ADC, so here you have an antibody with a toxin conjugated, and how can you hit only the cancer cells? It could be a CAR T cell, so a T cell equipped with a 
T cell receptor that we changed so that now carries a specific antibody binding element. So we can get the T cells out to the tumor and kill the tumor selectively. The problem is they're super toxic, very potent, and the risk of harming also the healthy cells is high. So how do we actually get something specific? I mean, there are HER2, CEA, EGFR out there, but there are problems. Maybe mucin type vocalization could help because we know from Springer and on, many, many years of research, that the truncated glycans are indeed selective for tumors. There is an elimination of the elongation. We get an increased expression of TN, sil TN especially, perhaps also T, and it's expressed in most of the epithelial cancers we look at, and it's not expressed in the healthy cell. So I don't think there's any doubt that uh, you actually have a truncated glycan as a cancer selective mark. So these are the healthy cells with their branch structures. And here with the cancer cell, we have these truncated glycans. The question is, is it a driver? Is it actually driving tumor genesis? And many years ago, we, we published this, where we took our first primitive skin model, knocked out uh, COSPEC, and I told you before that nothing really happened when we knocked out COSMIC in our new model. And it's true. When we have a stable epithelial cell line, very limited stuff is happening. But in this context, we have P53 mutated, and it's an unstable cell line. So I think it is truncation of glycans in combination with something else that drives the tumor genesis. And I think it fits nicely with all the murine work that is out there when you eliminate CO1, CO2, CO3, or in combination from the gastrointestinal tract you will get colitis and you will eventually get a tumor. And perhaps that's also because clearly the truncated glycans is also important for the interaction with the immune system as a checkpoint inhibitor, both for Ciclex and for MGL. So if we believe that all glycans are actually tumor drivers and they are linked to uh, bad prognosis and metastases, are they targetable? So here we can look again at the structures, and I think people have for many years tried to target TN and SILTN, created antibodies, there have even been in clinical trials. Most of the, these antibodies that have been used are rather low affinity. So it's IgM, IgG, but low affinity stuff, and especially when they try to humanize the antibodies. But could we do it a little different way? And we did it some years back. We said, okay, what if we do it as a combined epitope? So we take an antibody that binds the sugar, and then we lend a little binding element by the peptide backbone that creates a more stable interaction and will drive high affinity antibodies. So this is what we have done. And I think the question is, which target should we go for and where are the glycans localized and how can we create antigens that are specific? And here we can begin to harness these 15,000 targets that we just analyzed. So with that, we could create glycopeptides, do recombinant glycoproteins, we could use our genetically engineered cells as search tools, wild-type glycans, truncated glycans, and use that as a screen platform. So we have done that, and this is all done at Go Therapeutics, mice hybridomas, uh, rabbit B cells, and we have also used different um, uh, phage display strategies to develop antibodies we could then test as a CAR-T, as a bispecific, or an ADC. So these are all the programs. It's actually a team of five people. And these are all the programs that we have running. We have antibodies for most of these. We have antibodies. We have multiple antibodies for most of these. And just a few examples. We have the first class of antibodies that are super selective. Only recognize one protein with one sugar. And what you have here is an antibody. These are multiple different peptides. These are octet measurements of high affinity. And the red is high affinity. And here there's only affinity, strong affinity with one glycopeptide out of many. And if we just go through, and I'm sorry I cannot disclose the target, but the antibody recognized strongly with the glycopeptide, not with the non-glycosylate peptide. It reacts only with these cells once we have truncated the glycans, only with a cosmic knockout cell that has the galnac on the surface, not the wild-type glycans. It does not react with the wild-type glycans. It reacts selectively with tumors. In this case, it's just breast and lung cancer. And here we have used a very, very... Um, strong cutoff. So we wanted that all cells in the tumor were above 80% positive on their surface. And this is just a, as if we zoom in, we get very strong staining. It's selectively expressed on the surface. Another pitfall in this field, I think, not expressed on the surface of healthy cells. 
So if we take the antibody and then use it as an ADC in a patient-derived tumor model where we inoculated a patient tumor from a breast cancer that are triple negative. So there are no current treatments of the sort for triple negative breast cancer. And we treat with the ADC. This is the controls, and here is the treatment. And we basically get cure of four out of six mice, and this is good for a PDX model and two mice that still has a little residual disease but apart from that, going in definitely the right direction. At the end here, just another example of a more broadly reacting antibody that reacts with a TN, but actually on multiple different peptides. So that's a little more lax in this requirement for the peptide element. And the reason I show this, this is for CD44. It's our known sort of stem cell associated protein. It reacts in the stem region, uh, selected for the glycopeptide, selected for the right type of cells, stay in the tumors. But the reason I show this is that here we show that we can use it as a CAR-T and use our model as a safety measure. So we can take our skin model from before. I don't know whether you know, but skin had a ton of CD44. In the previous trials with CD44 antibodies, they had problems with peeling skin and all kinds of side effects. So if you now make a glycopeptide-specific TN CD44 antibody, you want to show that it's selective for the TN epitope and not react with wild type CD44. So here we took and mixed knockout cells. We took keratinocytes knocked out for cosmic, so they only express TN, and we overexpressed HRAS, so it's proliferating. So we get invasive behavior in the skin model. So this is all derived from the skin model. You get invasive behavior. If you look at the TN expression, you have overgrowth of the TN expressors, and you can combine it. Now, if we treat this model, with our CAR T, we get normal human skin without invasion, and there's no TN targets left in the skin. So it's clearly safe, we can use it, and it also works in vivo models that I did not show. So we have similar uh, stuff for most of our programs. We were super happy that Roche actually went in and bought one of our antibodies early on, some years ago now. Uh, nice with a title like this, right? Uh, $200 million deal five-member team. I can tell you I got a little call from the university saying, excuse me, what are you doing? Um, reality check was that we got a little sum, a little petty money, 10 million up front. And the point was that we can use those 10 millions to develop the other programs. And that is what we have done. So still the same five team member uh, group that has done this. And we just licensed out uh, two more antibodies for Stellas. And here we got a little bit more up front. And very large number here, and again, I got a call from the university, but that's how it works. So, I hope I have shown you that we have mapped the human oglycoproteome. We say different functions in cleavage protection, receptor modulation. We can generate the glycoengineered cell lines for multiple purposes. We can also do genetically engineered tissues. We can begin to define roles of glycans, at least in this setting, but of course, it's only this setting. And we can map glycan sites. Uh, and the availability of these genetically engineered cells and can be used as a platform for generate cancer-specific monoclonal antibodies. So really our aim is to decode the glycocalyx for glycan functions, like all of us. So I will leave that and just say thank you for, to you and to my group and our um, funding agencies for all the help and also for the team in Boston that has been instrumental, of course, and part, 100% responsible for what is going on on the cancer targeting strategy side. Thank you.